Okay, so it's the first time that I've been asked to talk about uh, tiered systems and migration at the same time. And so I've given some thought about the interrelationships between the two sets of issues towards the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe some of the issues around, my, around uh, multi-tiered health systems, and then I will um, switch to, to say a little bit about migration. Okay, so I'm essentially going to make six points. Um, this is the second slide now. Um, low and middle income countries' health systems are typically fragmented and stratified. Uh, different sections of the population use multiple access routes to reach providers. Individual providers operate in more, more than one institutional setting as dual practitioners, something I think you're very familiar with in, in Indonesia and in, in, and in the region uh, more generally. Um, incentives are shaped by these processes um, and the, those same in incentives are those that shape migration uh, and that's where I'm going to make the links between the, the, the tiered systems and the migration issues. And also very important to this region and, and, and to Indonesia in particular is the fact that strategies to achieve universal health care need to recognize and reshape these same incentives. So these issues are all closely interrelated. Move on to the next slide, please. This slide really, seem, really serves to illustrate the huge complexity, diversity of uh, health systems in different parts of low and in, in different low and middle income countries. In the top layer, could we have the yes? In the top layer of the um, slide, I'm showing uh, pharmaceutical retailing. In the middle layer, I'm showing um, primary clinics. And in the bottom layer, you've got different hospital level provision. You've got a mix of public and private. You've got a mix of the formal and the informal. And over the set of pictures, you can just get a sense of the huge diversity of what we're talking about when we talk about healthcare providers in low and middle income countries. So in the next slide, I'm making the additional point that beyond being diverse, the offerings available in the market are stratified in the sense that there's a hierarchy and that different elements of that hierarchy are offered to a hierarchy of patients. What this slide shows is some work from Africa in the uh, mid-1990s, which measured prices in total when you bundled the uh, elements of healthcare up uh, so that if we take cerebral malaria, for example, we can take the consultation fee and in addition to the consultation fee, the costs of any treatment that are uh, recommended until the patient is just discharged. And you can see that there's a huge variety of prices if we stick with cerebral malaria for an adult. Uh, and, and in fact, those, the two outlying prices are both offered by the same government hospital which has a separate offer for poor patients at 11,000 kwacha uh, and a different one for, for richer patients at nearly 300,000 kwacha. It's a huge difference in what people are expected to pay for what should in principle be the same clinical service, something that we'll come back to. The other hospitals with the M after them are, are mining hospitals owned by the copper mining sector in Zambia. Okay, next slide, please. Here's a similar story about drug retailing in Maputo in Mozambique, where the price is offered for the same drug, sometimes packaged as a generic, sometimes pack packaged as an origi originator brand, uh, are hugely different across the public sector, the private sector, and in pharmac pharmacies, which are quasi-governmental uh, pharmacies. And if you look at the two quotes that are uh, given here, you can see that the um, providers and the commentators are, are pointing out that these different uh, options in the market are offered to, different, to people of different economic means. Next slide, please. We were interested back in the 1990s when some of uh, the people in the room were, were students at the London School and when I was a, a young lecturer there, in whether or not there was a typology of health systems across low and middle income countries. 
And we proposed rather intuitively uh, the set of um, categories that you can see here. And you can pick out from these categories that we're proposing that there might be groupings across, uh, across characteristics of formality and informality in the private sector, or for profit and not for profit in the private sector, and across the concentration of roles at different levels of the system. Um, with a, a key underlying idea that a strong public sector might discipline the private sector in uh, allowing it to grow only in those areas where the public sector was not um, dominating. However, if you look at we need much more uh, certain So the net, uh... And we were unable to statistically demonstrate any of the um, um, typological characteristics that we had thought intuitively we might be able to. Now this might be because they're very poor data, we know that, uh, they're, they're both inaccurate and patchy, and it may be that the data just didn't allow us to find it. It could be because there genuinely are no uh, characteristics that cluster health systems. Uh, they may be pretty randomly spread across countries, the different characteristics of health systems. Or it might be because if you focus on these 38 countries with the highest child mortality, clearly you're focusing on countries where the health systems are pretty dysfunctional, or the child mortality would not be so high. And it may be that uh, those are really all in one cluster. And that's why we don't find the, the characteristics we're looking for. But this is the only exercise I know of that has statistically tried to establish whether or not there, are, there, there is a typology of health system types. Next slide, please. The point that different sections of the population use multiple access routes to reach providers is, I think, really well established and demonstrated by lots of different um, pieces of research over the years. And What's important to understand is that when people get sick, they don't automatically go to one qualified provider straight away that they know or have a regular relationship. What people generally do in multiple types of context all over the world is think about who, what the range of options there, there are available to them, what money they have, what other constraints they face in accessing different providers, and they do their best with the resources they have to navigate through the system often using multiple different types of provider, uh, taking multi making multiple attempts, continuing to try to resolve their problem until either they resolve it or they give up. Next slide, please. And at the same time, individual providers operate in, in lots of different institutional settings. So it's not just users that are weaving their way around the system in complicated ways. Providers, too, are offering multiple provisions in different parts of the system. And we proposed this typology again of uh, dual practice in a recent paper, again looking at African experience, but my experience of the Asian region suggests that there are a similar uh, set of uh, categories as, as, as we'll see later. Um, and I think the, the category of dual practice that we most often think of when we're talking about dual practice is what we're labeling dual practice outside public practice in distinct and separate private facilities. Most people think that's what dual practice is. But if you look at how providers are operating, they are substituting between those options and other options that allow them to practice in ways that are slightly closer to their public sector practice if they have one. So there's also private practice beside public practice in separate facilities that are also publicly owned, uh, but are um, run as separate enterprises from the public facilities with separate management and accounting systems. And the example in this paper is the Maputo Central Hospital Special Clinic, which sits next to the Maputo Central Hospital and caters for richer patients. A third category is private practice inside public facilities, where you have dedicated medical services, sometimes called um, private wards or private clinics. We call them pay beds in the UK National Health Service. 
Um, but these are inside, they have joint management and accounting systems, but they're still separately designated services for people who, who wish to pay more. And then the fourth category we're calling integrated, but really it's a polite word for, for informal charges. Sometimes it's very hard to distinguish within a single facility uh, who's having a private service and who's having a public service. It's all mixed up. Some people may be accessing a free service um, with uh, a high level of public subsidy. Other people may be being charged a high price even beyond the cost of the service. So that's really where the, the two things are, are, are completely integrated. And when providers are making choices about how to offer services and how to ensure an economic livelihood from, from providing health services, uh, they may be picking really across those four options and not just thinking about the outside category that we tend to think of in relation to dual practice. So I want to go back to Zambia, which I talked about a little earlier, and about the arrangements that, according to that categorization, would be inside. You saw that uh, data earlier uh, from the Ketwe General Hospital, uh, in which the price for a high-cost service was nearly 300,000 kwacha. The price for a low-cost service was about 10,000 kwacha. And this was because the Ambien Hospital's response to greater financial and management autonomy was to introduce or to extend two-tier service provision in the form of high-cost, low-cost wards and clinics. We were interested in the incentives in those arrangements and how if you were a provider with this integrated um, management and accounting system that I talked about before, how would you allocate your resources between the basic and the premium service if your main motive was, was to generate profit or, or revenue? Next slide. This quote tells us that we weren't the first people to ask this question. And in fact, a 19th century economist had asked it in relation to the classes in the railway. And if you read the quote, you can see that our concern here is that the incentives in this situation, where one provider is offering two services of different qualities to two different kinds of, of um, passenger, in the case of the railways, patient or consumer, in the case of healthcare, they might have an incentive to, re to suppress the quality in the low-class service in order to encourage people to use the high-class service. And it hurt, hits the poor not because it wants to hurt them, but to frighten the rich. So our question was, could that be going on in healthcare? Now, I don't have time to give you the, the full um, answer to that question, um, but on the next slide, you can see that um, we were, the work that we did raised concerns about that possibility. And it showed that institution and individuals would have a greater likelihood and more uh, option to uh, take that kind of approach where they have a greater degree of monopoly power. And therefore, these risks seem to be inherently highest for higher levels of the system where there's less competition in the system. So often, even though there's all this diversity and multiplicity of providers, there's not so much competition when you get to the hospital level. And also for the services of the scarcest health professionals, which might be specialist doctors in urban areas, but it could be any qualified health professional in a remote or rural area. Next slide. So the discussion of the tiers of the health system at this point is implicitly assumed a, a closed system. I think when we are talking about health systems, uh, we generally think about them as at the national level and as if they were closed and not influenced by things going on outside the national level. But moving on to migration, we have to, we have to recognize the way that um, migration challenges us to understand that the system is actually open that what's going on in other people's health systems is affecting our own health system. We also have to worry about what we call the counterfactual, what would happen if different arrangements were in place. And that's a very difficult question to answer because even if we can see different arrangements in different places, we don't know they would work, they would work the same on our own. So I think there are two points that link the tiered, uh, the tiered analysis to the migration analysis that I can only pose as questions because these are not um, questions I've ever tried to ask. 
in the context of any of my work or that I'm aware that anybody else has tried to ask. So the questions are, does dual practice help needed health staff in, in Indonesia? Um, sorry, the questions are, does dual practice keep needed health staff in Indonesia? Um, or in any other in any other country. So the, the, the argument behind that would be that higher health system tiers help retain health practitioners by giving people op options that aren't at other levels of the system. Um, but also there's been an argument that higher system tiers further embed maldistribution of the health workforce within a country. So the question there would be for Indonesia, does the opportunity for dual practice in Jakarta as to, uh, act as a disincentive to work in a remote area? So the important and very difficult to answer question is, what is the balance of these two processes? Next slide. So very quickly, I'm just going to run over a case study of the current situation uh, in Indonesia. I don't think I need to tell uh, the people here uh, the points on, on, on this slide, and I'll move quickly on to the next slide. I'm grateful to Dr. Meliala uh, for... Uh, these data which um, I believe derived from a project that he undertook with the Nussel Institute for Global Health, Health in Melbourne where, um, as you just heard, uh, I, I'm shortly to be moving. Um, what these data show is that uh, doctors in Indonesia earn a very high proportion of their incomes from private sector work and also that that proportion of their incomes increases substantially as they uh, become more specialized. Next slide. I also have some much older data from two-tier hospital service provision in Indonesia that comes uh, courtesy of Tom Bossert at Harvard University. And what this first slide shows is that when these uh, um, reforms in Indonesia that offered more um, uh, autonomy to uh, hospitals were introduced in the 1990s. Those that took those uh, opportunities up, the ones described as under vertical management in this figure, um, rapidly reduced the number of ordinary beds and presumably reallocated resources towards higher level, level beds in the system, whereas hospitals that weren't reformed in this way didn't do that. Next slide, please. And this slide shows the pattern of uh, cost recovery across the different bed levels uh, for those hospitals. Sorry, the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. This slide shows the pattern of uh, cost recovery and the idea that when you introduce these multiple tiers of beds, the high-level beds subsidize the cross-subsidy bed, the, the, the lower-level beds, um, is challenged by these data. The only place that was happening was in this small private hospital where the VIP patients were indeed charged sufficient levels uh, over and above the costs of their services uh, that you could argue that they were subsidizing the lower tier beds and indeed the 3B beds were, uh, were free. Um, but in the other hospitals, either uh, in the uh, ones that were still being managed in the old-fashioned way, it actually was the case that the uh, third tier A beds were the, were, were the highest level of cost recovery. Those patients were doing most, more cross-subsidizing than any other group of patients. Or in the case of the vertically managed hospital, that although there was the expected direction in the proportion cost recovery, even the VIP beds were recovering such a small uh, percentage uh, over their over their total costs, that they weren't cost subsidising much, and what you can see there is that the balance of the public subsidy is going towards people in beds one and two, where they are uh, receiving higher cost services, but are also um, uh, but but are not paying the full cost of those. So let me move to the next slide. I see you're already ahead of me. Um, this is also data from Dr. Meliala. Um, this shows that when the national health insurance uh, was piloted in Indonesia, the utilization response was much higher in Jakarta. 
Karmata, um, almost there was almost no utilization response in remote uh, Just going to move to my conclusions now. Um, national health insurance, as in uh, as in Indonesia, the whole point of it is sort of move by the point of view of basic services. Next slide, please. Could you move to the next slide, please? National health insurance removes price at the point of use for basic services, and that's the point of it. And that means that it allocates resources on the basis of demand or introduces what we call a per unit subsidy. The provider is paid according to the volume of services they provide instead of on a, on a flat rate. And our analysis in Zambia suggested that that price sensitive, that, that, that um, per unit subsidy better protects price sensitive poor users than a flat rate subsidy. However, the National Health Insurance pilot also showed that there's a provincial segmentation. It's not just a, a hierarchy of economic status that drives the segmentation of the health system. And that, that works very differently. So the conclusion there might be that the national health insurance is likely to protect the poor in Jakarta, but to disadvantage the more rural areas like Papua. Next slide. That suggests the need to separately protect the interprovincial distribution of resources. And you could do that um, in part by regulating prices not only of the basic services, but also the premium ones. You have to ensure that the premium ones are being charged at genuinely cost recovery rates and significantly in excess, or else the public subsidy ends up going back to the rich you know, in, in, through, the usual, through the usual mechanisms. Of course, it's important to be cautious in moving from theoretical analysis to policy advice. So I think one has to open up the questions in any specific context and ask, how can regulations, professional associations, the introduction and removal of different options in the dual practice typology, those are, those are policy options whether you set up beside clinics or inside clinics and wards. And how do those affect outcomes? And those outcomes include migration. And I think you'll agree that's a rich research agenda as well as an important policy agenda. Thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. Okay.